productivity as an idea was sort of generated back in the first and second industrial revolution. It's about throughput and output per hour. It, you're thinking Frederick Taylor and time and motion studies back to the production line. And then, you know, translate that in the second and third industrial revolution from in factory to in office. And we start computerizing in the office and here we are. And, and so even that progression, we've never actually stepped back and said, well, well what should we really be measuring? Welcome back, everyone, to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy shift going on all around us and explore the disruptive convergence of technology, business, and people. Here are your hosts, Ira Wolf and Jason Cochran. Hey, welcome back, everyone, for another episode of Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization. I'm Ira Wolf. And I'm Jason Cochran. If you think this is just another podcast, think again. We're the voice of the most important conversations on the future of work that are confronting business leaders and people today. And as you know by now, our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow and explore the ever-changing convergence of business, technology, and people. Jason, you know that every week I do anywhere from one to three, maybe five podcast or media interviews, and almost every conversation begins with, what in the world is Googleization? Well, you just nailed it. It's the convergence of people, business, and technology, or as I used to call it, which was a subtitle of my book, I describe it as the convergence of the wired, the tired, and technology. Well, today's episode is going to capture the very essence of Googleization because we have Steve Hatfield, Deloitte's future of work, global future of work leader. And we're going to be talking about something that you and I have been harping on for the past three years why organizations must go beyond pro measuring productivity to succeed in the age of Googleization. Now, I can almost hear the cheers and the applause from our listeners, many of them in HR, until they hear that going beyond productivity means quantifying the data they collect and don't collect yet. Because as soon as we hear about data collection from employees, Privacy flags and PR nightmares flash right in front of CEOs' eyes. So how does an organization gain the trust from employees to create a quantified organization? Well, you're not going to want to miss a word from what Steve has to say about this. But first, we're going to have our perfect labor storm segment, where on each episode, we focus on a disruptive, surprising, or worrisome trend that we believe that you should know about. And it's probably no surprise here that today we're going to share some data from Deloitte. So get this, Deloitte Global Skill-Based Organization Survey, that's a mouthful, found that 63% of work being performed today falls outside of a worker's core job description. Let me repeat that. 63% of work being performed today falls outside of a worker's core job description. If that's not a call for some new models for understanding how to engage, insp inspire, and develop workers to get things done, I don't know what is. But according to data from Deloitte 2023 Global Human Capital Trends Survey, the vast majority of business leaders, 83% of them, believe that leveraging worker data to create benefits for both the organization and its workers is very important or important for the future, the organization's future success. Yet only 19%, less than one out of five, believe they are ready to do so. But And maybe that's why a study by PwC revealed that 40% of global CEOs don't believe the organization will be economically viable within 10 years. And speaking of data, the wearable market, you know, the Fitbits and the Apple watches reached over 490 million shipments in 2022. And according to most experts, we are still far from even reaching its saturation point. That means more ability for more employers to capture more data, which raises the question, when does it go too far? Or is more data a good thing for employees and organizations? I can't wait to get this conversation started. Me either. And I'm going to keep my part short so we can get Steve on here. But there's no doubt that as we're getting smarter and better informed on the data that we collect, Ira, 
that it's going to evolve and improve not only what we should be measuring, but also the why behind what we're measuring. And here's just a brief example that just happened here a few weeks ago, and this happened to be in the medical field. Most medical professionals have been using body mass index, or BMI, as an estimate of body fat and overall health ever since physiologist Dr. Ansel Keys proposed the metric back in 1972. And so not only has BMI been used as the main screening tool for obesity for a long time, it's also been used to determine eligibility for weight loss medications, and it can also affect people's access to joint replacement surgeries and fertility treatments. But just last month, June of 2023, there is a movement to start shifting away from BMI as a measure of individual health risk alone. And this is coming from the American Medical Association. They've adopted a new policy on BMI because they've noted that BMI has led to significant limitations in clinical settings that have caused historical harm and use for racist exclusion. And so the new policy that the American Medical Association is acknowledging is that we need to be differentiating between lean and fat body mass. And they point out that it doesn't account for differences between racial and ethnic groups, sexes, and people at different ages in life when we're just using BMI. So if you're wondering why am I sharing this, the old ways that we've measured productivity in business are much akin to the BMI and how we used to measure physical health. We need a more nuanced approach to measure what really matters and moves the needle in terms of value creation for both people and organizations in the future of work. And it just so happens we've got no one better than Deloitte's own global future of work leader, Steve Hatfield, joining us today to set the record straight on this. But before we bring him on, just a little bit about Steve. He's a principal with Deloitte Consulting and serves as the global leader for future of work. He has more than 25 years of experience advising global organizations on issues of strategy, innovation, organization, people, culture, and change. So without further ado, let's give a warm Googleization Nation welcome to today's guest from Deloitte, Steve Hatfield. And innovation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you both. That's quite the introduction. Really appreciate the welcome. Absolutely. We've got a lot to get to today, Steve. And so b before we hop into the really meaty stuff, let's start here with you. How did you get interested in the concept of the future of work and even this work around becoming a quantified organization at Deloitte? Oh, that's a great question. So we, we have a, a human capital trends report that you actually quoted some stats from this is the 13th year that we've run this report. It's the long, largest longitudinal study of its kind. And we started to see the trends around the future of work back in like 2015. I remember writing one of the chapters around man and machine working together back then. And as we started to launch the program, we started to see these trends. The firm came to me and said, we need you to take on this global role. And for me at the time, it was being given my, the, you know, my dream job. And of course I said, yes. So I've been in the role since 2017, and it's been quite the ride to kind of watch these trends, both pre-pandemic when we were still talking about what is future of work, to post-pandemic, where now the question isn't so much about the future of work as it is that mass acceleration into all of the different trends we've been talking about. And Steve, we're going to be talking a lot about the quantified organization today, because this is a lot of the work you and your team at Deloitte are focused on, is helping us understand or move beyond just the way we're measuring productivity and harnessing data, understanding data in very different ways. So before we get into that stuff, maybe help us understand here at the outset, when we're using the term quantified organization, what does that mean from your perspective and Deloitte's perspective? Yeah, so we started to see, of course, these trends around people analytics, around sort of the way in which we can measure different things in the organizations. And we started to you know, debate back and forth, like what would be the way to frame that conversation about an organization today, a modern organization, in a world where you can pretty much begin to measure anything. We are going to consume 120 zettabytes of data this year alone, and the AI toolkits that are coming to the fore can help us unlock that data sets. What, what should we measure? And we took a page out of the idea of the quantified self, which goes back to something in you know, like the 80s. And, and, and of course, that's evolved with the whole dialogue on wearables. And we thought, well, in this world where we can measure anything, what would be the organizational version of that, the quantified organization? And we decided that 
that could be a really cool way to frame the idea that that you've all both articulated what we're putting forward in the report that we just published in that in a world where we can measure anything, well, really, what should we be measuring and why? Big question. We're, we're talking about the, the quantified organization. We're talking about more. I, I want to go to the meat of, of, of a challenge we got. And I, and I briefly mentioned this in the beginning. We're talking about collecting data. We're, we're talking about we, we need to, to have metrics beyond just measuring the traditional ways of productivity. And HR has notoriously collected lots of data or organizations have collected a lot of data on people. They haven't necessarily used it. And then when they used it, it was more to squeeze out profitability. Mm. Okay. So how, in, in addition to walking the privacy issue and how do we, how are, are, are you seeing, and I know what the intention is, but how are you seeing companies being able to overcome that balance is that we're, we're going to use this data for human performance, which you make a clear distinction of, and not use it to raise our stock price <laughs> or even for a smaller company for more profit for the owners? Well, I, I, it's a great question, Ira. I, I don't think we're, artic- we're saying that we shouldn't be thinking about the benefits of, say, the financial end of the story. It's just that Productivity as an idea was sort of generated back in the first and second industrial revolution. It's about throughput and output per hour. It, you're thinking Frederick Taylor and time and motion studies back to the production line. And then, you know, translate that in the second and third industrial revolution from in factory to in office. And we start computerizing in the office. And here we are. And, and so even that progression, we've never actually stepped back and said, well, well what should we really be measuring? I and mean, productivity has always been the frame. And and through the course of digitization, we pushed more and more and more and more on that efficiency angle. And even then, we could argue that there's more efficiencies to be gained. I mean, if you think about the digital workplace and the kind of apps that we've put on the desktop, all for the benefit of enhancing productivity, the typical organization is somewhere in the vicinity of 200 apps. The typical knowledge worker uses about 40 of them. Okta did a study. We toggle between these apps something like 1,200 times a day. It's like 32 lost days of productivity a year. So even that, right, that that progression from second to third industrial revolution will just computerize what we've been doing right along, as opposed to actually reimagining it in the world that's actually here, is sort of a nice example of this sort of direction of travel and that 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 went askew. So. Here we are now in a world where we can access these data sets in ways we never have before. And that's not to say that we don't have to take very, very seriously data privacy issues and personal issues around PII. And we don't have to take very, very seriously even um, core issues around like cyber and protection and all of those things. But the regulatory environment is creating this, I guess, this awareness in the worker that in some ways they own that data. GDPR has, in many respects, put that squarely on the, the, the workers in those countries. And GDPR frameworks have now been undertaken by 17 countries outside of Europe. And you can begin to see even some of the regulations that are happening in the U.S. in various states, Illinois and California. And, you know, frankly, what New York just put in place around AI, using AI toolkits for recruiting. And so there's this general thrust of the reg environment, again, that's sort of creating this intricate landscape. And so suddenly you're in this world where you've got this very high stakes opportunity, but you have to play the game right. You have to manage that productivity, that, that personal information and that the, the security around that. You have to manage the data privacy. You have to manage the reg environment. And fundamentally, what it boils down to is if you want to begin to access these data sets, which workers are generating, every day, passively in the way that they conduct their work, then you need to actually center on the topic of trust. And it becomes this interesting recipe about the workforce and about trust and about managing privacy and about managing the reg environment in order to unlock these data sets. What we found in the, in the, in the shaping of this conversation is that unfortunately, because of the way that organizations are still trying to figure this out, in many cases, it's beginning to backfire. Suddenly there's this, conversation in the market about productivity surveillance 
and uh, you know a counterbalance to that around um, productivity theater. And for me, that's just an indication of, as organizations are trying to navigate this, they may not be thinking about the complete recipe they need in place. And in order to actually get at what they're looking for, they have to step back a bit and, and figure out how to navigate this landscape, but put trust at the core of it. And Steve, with that, what, what were some of the other, in addition to, to making sure that trust is there, what were some of the other big takeaways that came out of this research, the longitudinal studies around the quantified organization? Sure. I think the other thing that became really interesting is that similarly to how you think a bit about stakeholder, uh, I'm sorry, about surveillance capitalism, and you know, for certain generations, they're very comfortable with a certain degree of surveillance as long as it's going to help me have a better consumer experience. We're finding that similar things are actually now starting to emerge within the worker experience. So another study came out, Gartner did one, 96% of those digital workers that they surveyed are by and large comfortable with organizations taking use of these data, these data sets if it's going to provide them with value. And now that becomes interesting. So what is the value you're providing them? What are they getting for it? And, and how are you providing that value? So for example, if it's going to provide them with insights into the skills that they have and the other opportunities in an organization where they can use those skills. Back to the skills-based organization stat that you mentioned, 63% of workers are spending time outside of the defines of their core job description. And more interestingly, those workers are looking for different and new opportunities within an organization. And if you can use the data set on their skills to provide them with insight into those opportunities, they're all for it. Another one that came through was if you can use these data sets to get them access to the information they need for the flow of their work, if it gives them, if it, if it helps the organization get that information to them faster, better, quicker, they're all for it. A third one was if it can help IT understand how to help me with an IT problem that's looming or to do better on my digital workplace back to the other stat, they're all for it. And so what became interesting is suddenly, you know, if you pierce the, the initial conversation, oh, I'm being surveilled and oh, I'm going to thwart that through theater, and oh, we don't want that to happen. But what's really going on underneath is, well, if you can take use of that information that I'm kicking off naturally and you protect it and I trust you and you give me something for it, some real benefit that helps me in my workday, then workers are actually really engaged in that. They're all for it. And Steve, you just described my relationship with Apple as well, <laughs> like Apple. Please take all of my information on my health records, the way that I sleep, how many steps I'm getting per day, because what you give me on the watch in terms of recommendations throughout the day of what I should be doing to improve my overall health and awareness, I'm like, yes, you're giving me something of value in return that's helping me stay on top of my game. So let me give you access to the information that can help you help me. And it sounds like that's what you're describing as well that's starting to happen in organizations with employees. Absolutely. And it's a great example, right? And we're fascinated by data, right? We're fascinated by the by the the quantified self and the information that provides. Well, why not? Would we, we why would we not be fascinated by that in terms of how that helps me in my workday to get my job done better and to perform at my job even better? Which is why when you start thinking about it, suddenly this conversation about throughput and output per hour feels really, you know, thin in terms of what it could, what we could actually be discussing around how workers perform at their best. And then frankly, what I really love about your example, Jason, is that often in the conversation, what I'm trying to also help organizations appreciate is the differences in humanity. So suddenly you start to think about, well, why am I working in a shift model? And why am I working certain days a week? And you're going right back to tropes that were developed back again in the second industrial revolution where, you know, Henry Ford put in place the shift model and created what we consider the nine to five workday. And, you know, humans in their different ways that they operate, morning people, night people, their biometrics, the rest of it. The reason why I would argue that we're all looking for so much more flexibility in this virtual and hybrid work model, back to some of the other studies we've done, somewhere in the vicinity of 75% of millennials and Gen Zs want the hybrid work model because of the flexibility it provides. Somewhere in the vicinity of 65% of the women in our Women at Work study, similar. They want the flexibility. What we're getting at is not just the ability to manage our work-life connection better. 
but also how we perform as humans better. I'm a morning person. You know, I want to start my day earlier. Why not? I want to kick off the at an earlier part in the day. Why not? As long as the outcomes that I'm producing are equally are equal to what the organization wants and of high quality, I should be allowed to to sort of work at my best. And that conversation you raised about wearables is sort of part of providing that information. It, it was a great question, and it was one that I I was thinking of as well because I, I but I wrote this question down is like why are people willing to trust Apple, kind of a, a, you know, a large organization that's out there and not necessarily trust their employer. So it's like, I wear my watch. I want to know, I, I, you know, I track my steps. I track my heart rate. I track my blood pressure. They have all this data where I am, where my location is, when I'm stressed, when I'm not stressed. But if an employer asks for that information, it's a different story. Exactly. And it shouldn't be. And for some organizations, it's not. We do trust our employer and our employer is clear with us about how we want to use the data, where it's going to be applied or not. We're not going to bring it to the table in terms of a year end performance conversation. We're going to bring it to the table in terms of a, how do we help you be better in terms of what you're doing every day? How do we help the team be better in terms of how it's operating every day? And how do we how does that then manifest in you know, a higher quality outcome that you as a team are working on. And if you trust your organization, have at it. And more and more, as we point out of that, those data sets are actually becoming available in a way and we aren't tapping into them and we need to be. How do we, I, how do organizations get to that point of, of crossing over that? Because uh, again, is that I'm, you know, willing to share with Apple and Google and, and everybody else has all this data about me. But, you know, if it came to an employer, they may not be willing to do it. How do we get to the point of understanding that the same I'm I'm willing to share my data so I don't have a stroke. So I feel less I'm not lonely. I feel better about myself, better about life. And that maybe they it will help find uh, it'll be able to identify if I'm a, a candidate to have Alzheimer's. You know, when it comes to work, it's like, well, if if I can do in thirty in thirty hours what I used to do in forty, then how do they not squeeze me for another ten? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so, I think I think first and foremost, it needs to be about a certain degree of worker consent. So, opting in or opting out, and and so being really transparent and clear about. Do you want to opt in or out of our taking advantage of these data sets? The digital exhaust because we're all on Zoom calls or the extent to which they have access, you have access to other information thanks to wearables, depending upon the worker and the work environment. I think second, there needs to be a really clear articulation of the value that you're that you're going to be provided as a worker for having provided this data. And then that has to be manifest, like the value needs to show up. So IT needs to be, in the example we raised, able to get to you and say, hey, we're noticing a thing that you're having a problem with and we can help you fix it, or the information you need needs to get to you in a timely way. I think those two sort of set the stage. Third, it, you know, fundamentally, there needs to be this very robust protection of privacy around that information and trusting the organization around that. I think if those things exist, so you're able to opt in, the value is clearly articulated and you experience it and your privacy is protected, you've gone a long way to shape that trust that's so critical here. And from there, I think many of the things that you're trying to achieve can unfold. Now, that said, there are certain areas where you might imagine workers may have more trepidation about what's available or not. So my skills data or how I'm operating on Zoom calls or who, 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 the, the way that teams are connecting or the kind of knowledge sharing that's taking place and the AI toolkits providing me with connection to others that are in the enterprise who I might want to talk to because they're doing similar things and it could help me do my job better. All of that tends to be back to that study that Gartner did safe ground for the digital worker. When we start getting into different realms like neurotechnology, right? Um, it, it starts to become even dicier, let's say. So I think we're gonna find over time that there's arenas where there's clear advantage 
and you can begin the quantification story that we're talking about. And there are others where it's still going to take a little bit longer for us to kind of parse through how to go after it. And Steve, you referenced this earlier. It seems like we're right now we're kind of in this phase. The easy part is collecting the data, right? Like I shouldn't say easy, but the easier part would be collecting the data. But then how do we make sense of that? How do we know what's the stuff we should be measuring and why it's important for our people and for the organization? What are you seeing through Deloitte that's helping to get some clarity around that for organizational leaders? And are there any organizations currently that really have a really good grasp of this yet? Yeah, that's a great question. So so we put forward in our study that we need you need to think about it in terms of the levels of shared value. And we put forward a framework that can help organizations sort of take stock of that. So the value happens at the worker level, the team level, the enterprise level, and of course, even societal level. As we start thinking about things like ESG metrics, or one of the technologies that we talked about in the study is a smart hat technology that are, that's used in, in more dangerous type work or uh, long haul trucking, for example, where there's societal value to helping a worker sort of appreciate if they're in a, the, the, their level of focus and if there's sort of a fatigue state emerging, things of that kind. And so that's one, the shared value framework and sort of those levels. And it goes right back to their articulation and providing the worker with, or the team with the sense of what they're gonna get. I think there are the, there is the need, however, for organizations to really step back and think about, well, what do we want to measure, right? What are we trying to get at essentially? And in that comment I made earlier, the 120 zettabytes of data that we will consume and the AI toolkits helping us unlock it, well, what should we go after? And so then Jason, you raised this whole thing about Apple and the wearables. You know, an organization that comes to mind is Hitachi has done something through the course of the pandemic that they're calling a happiness index. So using certain geospatial data and other data about how you're interacting with your teams, they're able to sort of identify, you know, if you will, happiness levels. And within that, they're able to then connect that to certain performance metrics, meaning the way in which customers are being engaged or the way in which teams are, are being engaged. And, and what's really interesting there is that they step back and thought, well, why don't we measure happiness and how do we gather various data sets to do that? And as a result, they're starting to be able to connect that dot to a better customer experience or a better workforce experience. And so th that one really struck me because of the way in which it was, well, what do we want to measure? And why not measure happiness, right? Why not? measure human performance. The days of measuring engagement in that old school way of, you know, taking an engagement survey once a year, we can move well past that in ways that organizations can understand this data ongoing in a continuous fashion, can calibrate accordingly, and can help leaders in this new virtual environment, you know, understand kind of really what's happening across their very large distributed, you know, virtual organization. So, so I, I'm an advocate for organizations sort of reaching for a different level of ambition around, well, what should we measure? Why not measure happiness? Why not measure, you know, different me metrics about how humans perform at their very best as humans? We are talking with Steve Hatfield, Deloitte's Global Future of Work Leader. A uh, fascinating conversation. Can't believe how quickly the time has gone. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, but there are a couple things. Uh, we put them in the comments. Deloitte is currently accepting or having the survey, open survey for the 2024 Global Human Capital Trends survey. The link is in the comments for those that are listening. We will put that in the show notes. Also, if you want, need links for the Beyond Productivity and the Skills-Based Organization, hopefully we'll talk a little bit more about that when we come back from the break. We'll put those links as well in the, there, those links are in the comments sections if you're watching live or the replay or if you're, li you're listening on one of the podcasts they will be in the show notes we're going to take a really quick break here we'll be right back stay tuned we're going to be coming back and talking a little bit more about how organizations are moving beyond productivity are you ready to turn your organization into a vibrant interconnected ecosystem where employees don't just work but thrive it's time to reimagine your workplace with every individual contributing uniquely to your collective success learn how to empower each team member to discover their own path 
while aligning with your organization's purpose. Create an environment where job satisfaction, employee engagement, and meaningful work intersect, creating a powerhouse of productivity, innovation, and fulfillment. Let us help you create the connected organization where you build bridges, not walls, between employees and their teams, roles, and your culture. So are you ready to bridge the gap? Let's embark on this journey together. Don't let your employees simply do their jobs and take home a paycheck. Let them connect, collaborate, and create a difference. Step into the future with a connected organization. Because when you're connected, you're unstoppable. Are your employees feeling stuck and just showing up for a paycheck? Is your workforce working harder to get back to normal than adapting to the future? It's time to help them break their addiction to certainty and develop a growth mindset. Developed by one of the world's top-rated future of work thought leaders, AQ Plus Mindset is a powerful tool to help your employees embrace change, adapt faster, and grow on the job. Conveniently delivered to any smartphone or laptop and easy to digest 5 to 10 minute lessons. Managers can sit back and watch employee attitude shift towards growth and innovation in just 30 days. Are you ready to help your employees thrive in this ever-changing, never-normal world? Encourage them to show more grit, resilience, adaptability, and unlock their potential? The journey to a growth-filled future starts with a growth mindset. Visit aqplusmindset.com or call 484-373-4300. And welcome back, everybody, to Geek Skeezers Googleization. We are thrilled to be joined by Steve Hatfield, Deloitte's global future of work leader with us today. And he's helping enlighten us on the quantified organization. And so, Steve, in this next segment here, let's dive in a little bit more in terms of jobs and job descriptions, because both you and also one of your colleagues at Deloitte, Sue Cantrell, has talked about, you know, in the future of work, the way we think about jobs is probably going to be different, that instead we're going to look at what are the the skills that are needed in order to accomplish tasks and then pulling people from potentially different quote unquote traditional departments to work on projects together based on the tasks and skills that are required. And in the data at the very beginning, we shared from, from your studies at Deloitte that 67% of the work that's done by a typical worker isn't in the job description it seems like we've got some work to do in terms of how we even conceptualize the work to be done. So can you help us sort that out a little bit? Sure. So in our human capital trends report, we talk about sort of navigating the end of jobs. And we're being a little cheeky there in the idea that jobs as they're currently shaped via job description, don't cut it anymore. And and we're, we've seen that through the data sets that you've shared and, and through our studies. But it also felt right in terms of the way that organizations are now thinking about how they structure their organizations and who's doing what within the organization, the the dynamics around the cross-functional team, the dynamics around networks of teams that are working in organizations. This is all part of the same trend. And so clearly what we've discovered is that the nature of what people do in any one job starts to transcend the inadequacies of the job description. And that it's really about the whole human and the potential they bring to the table. And I think the pandemic uncovered a lot of this. There was this moment in time where we only understood who was in our shop based on the bullets in the job description, not with who they really brought, what they really, what skills they really brought to the table. And we had entire organizations where part of the shop, the sort of the retail frontline worker perhaps was sort of sidelined and not able to be engaged in the work at hand because of the closures that took place where other parts of the shop were sort of in an accelerated mode of needing to get things done and we couldn't redirect the capacity of one part of the shop to the other to support. We saw this across retail banking and so forth. And so uh, it it really began to put a bright spotlight on, well, why don't we understand the full skills of the people that that are within our enterprise? And why aren't we being more thoughtful about the skills that we really want to enhance and develop? And how do we make sure that we, in a sense, are deploying those skills in the way that we need? And then finally, what gets really interesting is that, you know, people are choosing to go work in organizations because of learning and growth and development opportunities. In our Millennial and Gen Z study, that was the number two reason that millennials and Gen Zs would choose to work for an organization. 
Number one was flexibility. The second was learning and development and growth. And what we're talking about is this ability to kind of learn things through adjacencies that they're excited about and to go do cool and interesting things. And in order to do that, it's about being connected to that work activity. It's not about the bullets in their job description. So suddenly you're in this dynamic where organizations need to sort of tap into that and take advantage of that and understand that. And they're seeking to do so. And I think that, you know, not just the pandemic putting a spotlight on it, but the way in which AI tools and these generative AI toolkits are coming to the table, the way in which technology is advancing, it's also kind of emphasizing that we need to focus more on a certain set of enduring human skills that in a sense are portable outside of the job descriptions and functions, right? The, you know, empathic capabilities, the storytelling capabilities, the creativity, the complex systems thinking, the hypothesis driven problem solving, like those dimensions of what a human brings to the table, that extra human judgment will become more and more and more the norm, no matter what function you're in, no matter what job description you have. And so how are we spending time making sure that we're focused on, do we have those skills and are we enhancing and developing them to the extent that we need to be? Hey, Steve, I, I love the, the fact that you, you talked about bringing the whole person, the whole, the whole body. We were just talking about that in the neuroscience program I'm in, and, and it's like we have a whole brain. And in fact, I just launched uh, my new newsletter or a newsletter series with that. And I talked about the 12, it's about the 12 manager myths of how we manage uh, for the last and, and inspired and motivated and, and, and even hired people for the last. 70 or 80 years based on a left brain, right brain here in front of them, or you can't teach an old dog new tricks, or we only use 10% of our brain or how we can multitask. We, we, we basically had all these myths that we hired, and now we have actually the science to show that there is no such thing as a left brain, right brain. There's a whole brain. And we just have created these pathways, these networks and some of us are more creative, but it doesn't mean we can't be rational and logical and good at math. Exactly. And if you're good at math, it doesn't mean you can't be creative. So it, it's it's so telling of, of, of how we're across all, the, all these different models are, are, are essentially converging to disrupt it. And yet people still post a job description to find their next employee. Yes. Yes, they still do. It, and... We're seeing shifts away from that. And oh, yeah. we can now, the right? We career can. builder's almost done. Monster's done. Indeed's starting to fall back. <laughs> right. And it becomes a matter of still understanding that I need a, 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 a member of my workforce ecosystem to come to the table to help us get certain things done. And that within that, that person, we need them to bring certain skills and capabilities to the table, enduring human skills or certifications in certain things and certain technologies. But it, it becomes more of them being a member of the team, driving out a certain outcome. And so you start to see these organizational hierarchies that flatten. You're starting to see, of course, the more team-based work. You're starting to see dynamics that feel a bit more of what you might see in a pro professional services firm or financial services firm or technology firm where, you know, there's a certain level in a band, but all the people working within that band, a director or a vice president or an analyst, they're doing all sorts of very different things. And it becomes a more guild oriented, more practice oriented. And people with skills are sort of porting out of those practices to go work on various team activities. Each team, of course, focused on a different product or an outcome. It raises real questions about sort of what is the nature of the org structure that we need to have as well going forward. Again, all of it sort of harkens back to that legacy mindset, the first and second industrial revolution, as I keep talking about, where it was about the hierarchy and it was about the job description and the, the person filling that slot. And it was about the command and control. Whereas today it's much more bottoms up. It's much more about tapping into worker agency, putting people on the digital platforms and letting um, the information available in terms of what's what work is being done, what skills we need, where there's cool things to be done and letting workers kind of begin to drive a little bit of their own career path and direction. So Steve, for an organization that may be like, okay, we, we need to start moving away from job descriptions and move towards understanding our inventory of skills and what are the skills we may be lacking that we need to look for in the market. What do you recommend as a first step 
for those organizations in terms of wrapping their head around this? Sure. So we think it's really important that organizations think about creating, if you will, a skills hub, which is a construct whereby what you're doing is you're thinking about, well, what are those skills cross-cutting within the organizations and how are we doing the right work around making sure that we have those to the extent that we need them? You connect into that the dimensions of workforce workforce planning so you understand what skills you have and where. You connect into that dimensions around, well, what's possible now in terms of worker ecosystems? Again, think about it in terms of how do I curate an ecosystem of of um, the skills that I need that can come to the table. They don't always necessarily need to be a full-time employee. You have the gig workers and the contractors and the vendors and the rest. And especially when you're talking about more hard to find technology skills, it might be value in having you know, different parts of the ecosystem available for that skill set. And then third, the skills hub does a little bit of the work around helping teams and functions think about, well, how is the work organized so that we can tap into the right skills that we need when we need them? What becomes interesting here is those constructs all start to live on digital platforms. So there are platforms out there, Eightfold AI and Gloat and others that enable you to kind of create that digital fluidity within the organization that I'm talking about. And so the hub is a way in which you can begin to take stock of what that would look like, you know, different than the traditional org structure and job description and enable that digital platform to bring more of that to life. And we saw various organizations start to use these in interesting ways. And the story we often talk about is, you know, putting in place an, a, an, an internal opportunity marketplace platform. And uh, Unilever, for example, did this. And ostensibly, I think when they did it, they did it with an eye to things that would be a little bit more about making available research opportunities or social impact opportunities or community building opportunities, things of that kind. But in the course of the pandemic, they were able to redirect to using that platform 500,000 FTE hours to the different customer missions that they had to, to take on mm-hmm. as a result of the new needs they had, creating PPE and sanitizer and all the rest. And so suddenly it sort of was a, became a really interesting example of how to tap into sort of that agency, those different skills, where workers are working and how to redirect them as you need. And it's becoming more and more the story. So our view is that a skills hub enables you to sort of begin to structure all that and, of course, gives you the the fuel, the framework upon which to then insert the digital platform to make it all happen. Steve, you you hit on this earlier and now you sort of nicely closed, almost closed the loop on it, is creating this hub. Last week, we had Josh Green, who is work, is it Work3? Work3 Institute. Institute. at, At Harvard, yeah. And we and and his title, he has got a new book coming out. It's called "Employment Is Dead." So you, you talk, you, you you sort of referenced that in the beginning. Um, but he's he's talking about two things. One is the, how the metaverse or that type of technology may change that. But in the other part was having a hub where the skills are ch- are shared, maybe with your suppliers with your vendors with within a network so it's not just knowing having a hub for your organization but where might those skills be useful for another organization and the same token reciprocal how you may be able to fill those voids in a broader sense play out we're absolutely seeing organizations look at more ecosystem plays like the one you're describing the hub no question and and starting to recognize frankly ira Organizations have long been using other players as part of their broader ecosystem, you know, in order to achieve a business outcome for for years. The, you know, the idea of outsourcing, right? (laughs) Vendors and partners, right? How to bring gig workers to the table. I think, I think the the pandemic, and I often talk about the acceleration, but the pandemic made it clearer how those players would come to the table in a in a way that they may not have appreciated in the past. Just another tile on the screen essentially, right? And suddenly the digital platforms have emerged whereby you can begin to put them all together in a way to curate who you need and where you need them. The new twist is that organizations are now recognizing they need to orchestrate these more thoroughly. So they need to actually, who really owns the ecosystem? I mean, HR clearly owns, if you will, the full-time and part-time employees. But when you start talking about all the other players, 
the IT vendors that come to the table, the gig workers, the, the, the different players within sort of a marketing organization, who owns all those folks? And how do we ensure that we're curating who we need? How do we ensure that they all have a good experience similar to what your full-time employee would have? How do we ensure that we've made it easy to plug and play so they can connect in and the ease of working with them is sort of enhanced? And so what we're seeing now are organizations take stock in terms of how to orchestrate those and be more intentional about it. We did a study with MIT on this topic. Those organizations that are being intentional are eight times more likely to help a project team find the ecosystem player that they need to get something done, and five times more likely to help a team reorganize the work itself so that that player can slot in more quickly. Amazing, Steve. You mentioned, it just slipped my head, but we always, we close this this part of the segment with a question that we, we like to ask is, was there a question that we should have asked you, but we didn't? Well, I, I feel like we've not yet hit the fun, the question of the day around generative AI and how it plays into all of this. So perhaps that's a question because clearly it's kind of a little bit of the engine underneath a lot of it. Can you briefly share? And we'd love to have you back to continue this. So maybe this will be a teaser for another episode. Sure. I mean, I think that if you start to pull on the thread of what these AI and robotics toolkits are actually doing, they, in part, unlock the ability for us to take advantage of the 120 zettabytes of data to measure anything, right? That, that experience we keep talking about, that you, what value would you give to the employee? They're part of parsing through that information. Two, I think that they really begin to underscore even further why we need a different measure than just productivity. Because what they start to do is really put it, boil down what the human is doing to just those things that are uniquely human that are much more about human judgment or human analytics or human creativity. And so suddenly the productivity measure doesn't suit for that at all. If you think of like old school process redesign, you always had this step where it was like, and suddenly you would, you would step one in the process, step two in the process, and then suddenly you'd be like, okay, analyze. And was, you know, that's where code word for what the human would do for a period, right? With the AI toolkits, they're just starting to push the envelope on sort of really moving the efficiency story and lead, leaving, leaving us with this human judgment dimension. So suddenly this beyond productivity takes even more resonance. And then finally, when you get back to ecosystems and skills and skills matching and opportunities in organizations, it's the AI toolkits that are doing a lot of that internal work, matching and connecting and driving within the, the fabric of the organization. And so they're also making a lot of what we're talking about in those dimensions possible. Steve, we've definitely got to go deeper on this and have you back again for another episode because just what you shared there, that's a perfect appetizer. This whole new world of what's out there with generative AI and that we're just now in the very infant steps of playing with and understanding it. It's fascinating to think what this could look like even six months to a year from now. So Absolutely. hopefully we can get you back for, for a follow-up conversation on that. But two more segments as we get ready to wrap up here. Two quick ones here. The first one is called Hopes and Fears. And so very simply, I just have one question for you. What are your hopes and fears for the future? So I see a world of possibility here. I think that a whole new world of work is opening up and that we can really, really reimagine. My fear is that we sort of still continue to hook ourselves onto legacy mindsets and the old ways of working. And we have to really push past that. I mean, it, it served us for a time, but um, it's, it's a new world now. And so, you know, when you get into these return to office debates and these old tropes about this is how it always worked and this is how what made me successful, I start to really, I start to bristle a bit because it means that we're not thinking about this reimagined future as much as we're thinking about, well, this is how I was successful from a legacy past. And so those are my hopes and fears. Perfect. And for our last segment, we're going to do a lightning round. So three questions. And we're going to dial it down a bit from we've been talking professional. Now let's get to know a little bit more the personal side of Steve Hatfield. And so, Steve, let's start with this one. What's maybe a favorite band, musical artist or song that you have? I'm sort of an 80s guy. Uh, Peter Gabriel has long been one of my favorites. And, you know, Salisbury Hill and, and In Your Eyes are, are songs that I always sort of stop and get chills when I listen to them. So that's the one I would put forward. Awesome. Love it. I think that's the first time we've gotten Peter Gabriel, Ira. And... 
I definitely appreciate the 80s as well. I'm in that micro generation of the Zennials. So okay. I'm an old millennial and a very young Gen Xer. And the 80s was my jam. So hearing an 80s band be referenced here on that part, I absolutely love it. How about this one, Steve? If there's one person in the history of the world that you could meet, who would it be? So I don't want to turn this into a political discussion, but as of late, I've been wishing I could have spent time with a founding father, like a Ben Franklin or Sam Adams or Thomas Jefferson, just really to understand what were they thinking in the day when they were trying to chart this course for a new democracy? Because think about it, for thousands of years, it had been monarchies and they took the step on a democracy, but we spend so much time now, unfortunately, in like what the founding fathers thought. And you can pick that part of the constitution. I would love to be able to really understand what they thought. And that just triggered something in my head. That's fascinating because you think about, today we have all these tools to be able to get people to rally around a concept and bring about innovation. They did this back in the day, who knows how. I mean, they've right. had people riding on horses, spreading the message and stuff like that. It's right. fascinating to reframe, just like you did, the story of our independence within innovation at that time and how everybody was able to rally around that specific cause. And last one here, Steve, how about a superpower? If you could pick any superpower in the world, what would you pick? So as a kid, I read the book, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, and it was about the evolution of Jonathan the Seagull. And he got to a point where it was about thought, speed, transportation. So he could think of a place and suddenly emerge there without having the trials and tribulations of travel to get there. And I've long felt like that would be the coolest superpower to just show up in the place that you dream of being in. And I think maybe that's a sign of having been a consultant for 25 years. I love that. And that is a more nuanced answer. A lot of times we get teleportation, but we never consider just because you can teleport doesn't mean that you teleport to the place you need to go or you're wanting to go. So you provided that nuance of, nope, you've got to have it finely tuned to where you're making sure you're getting to the destination where you want to go. Steve, thank you so much for being with us today. Before we let you go, what are some ways folks can learn more about you, connect with you, and more of the work that Deloitte's doing? Sure, absolutely. So you can find the reports that we talked about out on Deloitte.com, either backslash future of work or backslash QO for quantified org or backslash SBO for skills-based organization or HC trends. And then uh, for me directly, LinkedIn is best. Great. Steve, thank you again so much for joining us. In incredible insights here for Ira and I and our audience as well. And we'll look forward to having you on again in the future. Terrific. Look forward to it. Thank you both. Yeah, we're very grateful, Steve. And by the way, I did remember what I was going to say before. You you mentioned and and you, it acued me at the end. You talked about a legacy. You talked about legacy mindsets, and you referenced full time work. And I was going to say is isn't is full time work a legacy framework? When we talk about full time, part time, pubs, skills. Ira, you're opening up a whole other show, right? <laughs> but yes, I would say yes, right? I mean, in some ways, you can see the rise yeah. of that through the way that people have side hustles and gig yeah. workers in this portfolio, different things that people do, right? Uh, in an odd way, I think we're coming back full circle to pre-industrial revolutionary times where it was about being more art and artisan all and doing a variety of different things, right? Well, well the whole so, basis of neuroscience is based on foraging. There we go. Come back. Well, definitely want to bring you back. We're grateful you took out the time today. It's a pleasure to meet you and we'll definitely be talking again. Thanks. Thank you. Oh my goodness, Ira. I took a lot of notes today I can for imagine. you. What what were some of the big takeaways for you today from Steve? Well, a couple sort of hashtags that popped up. One was surveillance capitalism, <laughs> which which sort of basically summarized my question of how do we grit that balance between squeezing more out of people because now we can keep them healthier or more well-being or we re recognize when they're most productive. So I, I love that surveil surveillance capitalism. Another one, but I think it summed up at the end, one of the questions was Steve asked who, we talked about the ecosystem of a hub and was who owns that ecosystem. And that probably is another segment we can have Steve back for about the block, about blockchain. Absolutely. Uh, 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 about who owns the data, who owns that ecosystem. And if you believe that we're moving toward having our data on the blockchain, 
or you know whatever variation of that is, is that we own the data. So who actually controls the ecosystem? Fascinating. It was for me. I was having a lot of flashbacks to the Matrix movie <laughs> and realizing just how programmed we all have become to these industrialized standards of you got to work 40 hours a week. It's got to be from nine to five. It's got to be within an organizational structure where you have a manager for every 10 employees. And everything we talked about today with Steve is the deconstruction of that, that those the more we put those barriers and we put things in, in isolation or we compartmentalize, we lose that fluidity. We lose a lot of those human capability skills that are uniquely ours where we bring value. And it's and it's really refreshing to hear that in the future of work, we're not going to be focusing on job descriptions anymore. Who cares you know, what the job description is? What skills do you have? And how can we leverage those skills to get these tasks done to deliver value for our clients? So it's um, all going to come down to green pill, red pill. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. And I think we're all going to take the one from Morpheus that's going to help us wake up here in the future of work and create a better future of work for everybody. We've just got to get past some legacy thinking as Steve put it, to help us get there. And I think we're well on our way. But Googleization Nation, I want to thank you for tuning in today. Thank you for being a subscriber. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so on YouTube, on Facebook, Instagram, and then obviously all the podcast platforms as well. We appreciate you tuning in every week. But until next time, I'm Jason Cochran signing off. And I'm Ira Wolf. Thank you very much for being part of Googleization Nation. Thank you to Steve Hatfield and Deloitte for all the great work that they're doing. All the links to everything that we talked about today will be provided in the show notes or they're in the comments. And also just wanted to I'll put this in the show notes as well. If you want to subscribe to my newsletter, uh, which is about the 12 myths and, and beyond, it's, uh, the series is called Mind Over Myth. You can go to irawolf.beehive, that's B-E-E-H-I-I-V.com. So it's irawolf.beehive.com. It's free. And please uh, share it and let me know how you're doing. And until next week, don't let the shift hit your plans. Thanks for listening to Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization. This show was produced and edited by Hilton Productions.